gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever He is my life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel to which I cling. All else I count as lost. For there where justice and mercy be, He saved me on the cross. So no more I boast in what I can bring. No more I carry the weight of sin. For He has brought me from death to life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel where hope is found, the empty tomb still speaks, for death could not keep my hand in the gospel of Jesus. Hey, will you stand right now, and we're going to sing together. Are you ready? Are you there, FBC? Good morning, good morning. My name's Patrick. I'm the leader of this team today, one of the pastors here, and we just love using music to direct your attention towards Christ. So let's do that now. I thought one drummer, sure, fine, easy. Two, eh, three drummers. Now you got worship, right? Um, I'm kidding. We won't blow you away. We've all committed not to do George of the Jungle this morning. Let's direct our attention towards Christ through these words. I once was lost, I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to Sing, 
your father used. Your father used my ransom wife in any way you choose and let my soul. that we could gather and that we could worship you and our desire is to offer ourselves to you you deserve all of our focus all of our love all of our commitment all of it because of what you have done for us we're so thankful to know you and to know that we have a hope to be with you forever thank you again for giving that to us through your son Jesus Christ and for all the incredible blessings that you've just lavished on us and Father, we forget often what you've done. And we pray, Father, that we might remember in a sweet way as we've gathered today and to truly worship you with our very lives and hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And you may be seated. And welcome to Faith Bible Church this morning. My name is Chris Mueller. And standing with me is Alex and his wife Emily and uh, Bob and his wife Jessica is coming right up. And they are men in training in our midst, but before we introduce them to you, I wanted to make sure that you knew that if you're new with us today, we wanted to give you a special welcome. Now, some people are saying, I want to kind of know a little bit more about Faith Bible Church, so grab that little QR code with your phone and find out all the information you'd want to find out. Now, some of people are saying, hey, I'd kind of like to know how to make this my church family. Pretty simple. Join a community group. Join a ministry and get that weekly update that comes out on Wednesdays, and then you'll be in the flow of information. And again, thank you for being with us. Maybe you're not aware of this, but Faith Bible Church is actually an extension 
of the Master Seminary. It's the seventh extension, and uh, I was told the last extension of the seminary. And so we have men in our midst who are actually going through this process with us, and you see now two of them standing here uh, uh, before us, and we kind of wanted to ask them a couple of questions about where they're at in their process and what God's teaching them, and to hear from them this morning. So you could be praying for them, because they really need your prayers, if you would. Alex, uh, there em- with Emily there. Tell us how the Lord is shaping and preparing you for all His purposes. Well, yeah, I'm currently in the third year of our church's training center process, and I'm in my first semester at the Master's Seminary. Oh, both- small load. Yeah, j- yeah, just a little yeah, bit. Okay. Uh, both TC and TMS have been just absolutely incredible. Um, through TC, it's kind of God is showing me, like, how has He built me? How am I gifted? And without TC, I don't think I would be going to seminary, so super thankful for that. Um, But at seminary, it's honestly been a super humbling experience, simply because I walk out of class and I realize, like, how much I just don't know. And so I'm super thankful that God has kind of put me a greater desire to study and to know Him more, but I'm getting exposure in the original languages, the philosophy of pastoring, and just getting a deeper understanding of the New Testament Um, Because my desire is to, you know, learn how to preach the word and how to pastor a church, honestly, because I love people and I see, and I want to see people become complete in Christ. So I'm super thankful for a seminary that is devoted to giving me the tools to do that in a church that is helping train men in that process. Yeah, I have a weird question and I don't expect an answer, but does does the baby leap when Alex preaches? That's what I wanted to know. (laughs) Okay, good. That's good. Good, good. So Bob and Jessica, I'm sure terrified up here, Jessica. Great to have you here. Uh, But uh, Bob, uh, you know, how have you been balancing homework and ministry and life and CG and family and ah, all that stuff? So how does that work? Yeah, you've heard the... Uh, Is it working? Come on, try it again. Check, check, check. There There you go. Uh, So you've heard the analogy of the plates spinning. Um, I feel like sometimes I don't even know where all the plates are. Um, (laughs) It, that's just the reality of it. We're, we're balancing a lot. Um, I think the biggest thing has been the seminary training focusing our hearts on faithfulness to the Lord in, in all things. Um, Matthew 25 and the parable on uh, the stewards, um, it has just impacted me in, in that way where knowing that whatever talents we're given, whatever um, skills and resources and opportunities we have, that we would do everything faithfully. Hmm. Um, Jesus even said in John 4, uh, my food, the disciples were trying to get him to eat, and he's like, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And I think for us, it doesn't matter how much is on our plates or what plates are spinning or where they are, we just want to be faithful with what we've been given. And I echo Alex, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to learn God's word and to be able to practice ministry um, with all of you, and um, we're just beyond blessed to have that opportunity. So that's... That's awesome. Yeah. Jessica, tell us, how, what, how is this enriching your home? How is this making things better or worse or whatever? You know, that kind of thing. So how, what's happening? So um, Bob is continually growing in humility starting from TC until now. The Lord is um, continually growing him in a deeper recognition of the weight of responsibility for what he's being equipped for, whatever that might be. Um, And also the pastoral ministries class that he took um, was really impactful in growing our love for the church and also um, growing Bob even more in his intentionality with our family and our community group and those around us, whether it be just in normal teaching and training of our family um, or walking through sicknesses or trials. That's awesome. That's great. Well, make sure you pray for them, and would you just thank them for sharing with us this morning, if you would. Thanks so much, you guys. That's awesome. Well, hopefully, you ladies, your hearts are at rest, because coming up in uh, February on the 11th, you want to mark the date. You know how they send out a little invitation to tell you to mark the date? Well, here's our mark the date, February 11th, Saturday. It's a one-day women's conference. Danielle Hurley's going to come in. He's, she's the wife of Shannon Hurley, our missionary family in Uganda. And uh, you want to just put that on your calendar for that particular date. It's going to be a very special, special time. But it's, is your heart at rest or a heart at rest. It's going to be very, very encouraging for you. Also, I wanted to let you know about our Thanksgiving Eve as well as Christmas Eve and Christmas services. Just a reminder, actually it's a week from Wednesday. Are you ready for the holidays? 
Yeah, some of you are going, no, and others of you are going, yes, and anyway, I heard today about a national holiday. The National Leftover Day is on Friday after Thanksgiving, uh, but uh, that's very encouraging. But on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock for one hour, one hour of Thanksgiving, we want you to come and be a part. Now, there's going to be special child care from 0 to 4, and you have to sign up for that at that Thanksgiving Eve service. So 0 to 4, you want to sign up for it, and, and you need to do that right away because there's limited spots, so please do so. But it's one hour from 6 to 7, just one hour of Thanksgiving, one hour of thankfulness. You want to be right here in this room. And then on Christmas, three duplicate services, Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, it's a 90-minute service. And then on Sunday morning at 8.30 and 10.30, those are our old times that we used to meet at, and it'll be right in here, a 90-minute service. We're going to have wonderful celebrations on the patio as well. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be a very, very special time. And then during greeting time, to make sure we're taking communion today, as we're trying to sandwich this in with our shorter service time, uh, we want to make sure that it's actually a special time. So make sure you're prepared, and that during the greeting time, you might want to get some of the uh, uh, elements that the men have. And so if you raise your hand, they'll come and get that for you. But you also want to make sure you're welcoming the people who are around you. Don't miss that opportunity. Even if you're in your hoodie today or your hat, it doesn't matter. Uh, try to meet someone new and welcome them, especially if they don't have a smile on their face. So let's stand and greet one another, if you would, please. Okay, come on back if you would. Returnez-vous, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Come on back. I'm, I'm just going to stand here because for you two. It's a direct, direct line. It's really all about you today. Remember when your kids boldly claimed... They looked up at you and they said, I can do it. And when in fact you knew they couldn't do it. I could tie my shoes. I could jump from this place. I can turn it on. I could do it. And parents, we, we want our kids to gain in that self-confidence that they would be able to do and accomplish those things. It's sad though when you think about it, it's that very confidence that works against us in the Christian life. The same human pride that pushes kids to shout, I can do it, is actually what keeps some people from Christ. It actually sometimes keeps and hinders our growth in Christ. You see, we cannot justify ourselves and we cannot sanctify ourselves. In other words, we come to Christ dependently and we grow in Christ dependently. We need to have self-confidence die and Christ confidence live in our lives. We need to live everything in our lives dependently on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. That's the struggle that the Galatians were battling. They were struggling right after Paul had finished the first missionary journey. He returns home to the home church at Antioch. Immediately, these teachers began to tempt them to embrace a salvation of self-confidence works instead of and rejecting the true salvation of Christ's confident grace. Almost immediately after return, these Judaizers began to infiltrate the t uh, these churches, teaching them that basically it was more spiritual and more accurate when it concerns salvation for them to obey Jewish rules or to eat Jewish food or to follow Jewish practices instead of embracing the true gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. They were teaching these new churches that were filled with baby Christians and almost Christians and a few make-believers that they needed to be Jews first before they could actually be saved. So this really, they did this exalting Jewish practices, and as they began to try to make inroads, they said, well, no, Paul said, so they began to undermine Paul's apostleship and his life. So Paul is absolutely shocked by their desertion from the truth, 
So in a very personal and biographical way in chapters 1 and 2 of Galatians, he shares with them about the reality of his apostleship and also the reality of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, the true gospel. And he's doing that in a very personal way to them, and he teaches that all their confidence needs to be in God through Christ and not in their own behavior, not in their own works, and none of it dependent on you, all of it dependent on Christ. This is a very serious issue, and I've reminded you multiple times that you can make a lot of mistakes in the Christian life, but you cannot make a mistake about this. You cannot be in error about this, because that spiritual treason will result in your eternal destruction. You cannot undermine the gospel that it is grace alone. This is a mistake that you must not move from. You can't move from Christ confidence to self-confidence in regard to salvation. If you can be justified, saved, by works in any way, Christ died for nothing. Understand that. So today, we're going to open up chapter 3 of Galatians. And if you're new with us, we're working our way through this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and word by word, and understand when we finally get to Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, this justification is explained, and the apostle is going to basically say in this first five verses, are you ready? Hang on. Your experience as a Christian, your experience before God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father, that experiential relationship that occurred at the point of your salvation is evidence of, of that it's all about God and not about you. It's evidence. He, he says it's certain evidence that you have been graciously accepted by God. He just talks in this one section about your experience in the Christian life. Apart from any human effort, apart from any rule keeping, apart from any religious action, he wants to make sure that you know and reminding you of the reality of where you've been in your walk. This is a very important passage for you and for I today, because would you agree that we have a tendency to drift? Can I hear an amen to that? We tend to drift from our confidence in God to our confidence in ourselves. We start functioning all throughout every day. Come on, nod your head, that we're just doing it at our own strength, and we're not saying, Lord, I need you. I'm relying on you for everything. And therefore, we need to be reminded of this. So how does Paul say it? Well, read aloud with me, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, in your outline together. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Here we go. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now again, I brought my iPad with me to kind of illustrate some things. And I wanted to show you this up on the board. It, 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 first time I look at this text, and I've highlighted things to make it easier for you. I see, oh, the Spirit. Whoops. I've got to get that right. The Spirit, and the Spirit, and the Spirit. Wow, the Holy Spirit, a lot in here. And then, oh, wow, Jesus Christ right here. And then the Spirit, and then God the Father. The Trinity is right here. Whoa. And then he's talking about by the works of the law or the hearing of faith, by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. So you've got the triune God involved in your salvation. You have the Holy Spirit involved in your salvation. And man, this is incredible. Wow, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it is God who is totally involved in your dependence on the Spirit of God and your dependence on the triune God in this whole process. It's an amazing passage. And so how does he do it? How is he going to strip us from this reliance upon ourselves, which the Galatians were erring on, to our, our dependence upon Jesus Christ? Well, these words break down three ways, and there's three obvious points that come out of the text. Point number one in your outline, if you're going to strip off this personal self-dependence, then you need to grow confident in the crucifixion of Christ for you. Grow confident in the crucifixion. The crucifixion is a reminder that salvation was accomplished by God, not you. 
It's a reminder that God did the work and you didn't do the work. Are you with me on that? And therefore, why would you be confident in yourself when God had to save you? Tracking with me so far? That's what he's going to say. Look at verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Foolish here doesn't mean that you're ignorant. It means you're disobedient. He's talking about their disobedience. They had a wrong heart attitude, and they had definitely a shameful lack of faith, and they began to move away from that faith relationship. Now, would you agree that all of us in this room have been foolish? Yes? Sure. And we tend to get, you know, doubtful and disobedient, and you, you want to stop that. It's pretty simple. You got to just make sure, am I being obedient to the Scripture? Ask your heart. Ask the Lord, am I being obedient to Christ's word? Am I dependent upon his Holy Spirit? So one, his word, two, his spirit, and three, am I being humble before the Father? You want to stop that foolishness and that self-dependency, you want to begin to ask those three questions right up front. Paul is basically saying here to us, don't be like the Galatians. Don't do what they did. Here he's expressing his outrage at the Galatians' defection. Why should they be outraged? Well, listen to John Calvin as he explains that question. He says this, quote, For when we hear that the Son of God with all his blessings is rejected and that his death is esteemed as nothing, what godly mind will not break out into indignation? As far as Paul is able to tell, the Galatians were guilty of sheer spiritual stupidity. Thank you, John Calvin. End quote. Paul asks, who, look at verse 1, has bewitched you? He's he's just appalled at what's going on and how they so quickly have moved away from salvation by grace alone. And that bewitched is this idea of misled. It has to do with flattery. It has to do with making false promises. Uh, It's this idea of almost, you know, taking a pagan understanding of casting a spell on you or holding someone spellbound, and and basically it's as if a sorcerer had cast a spell or something in the pagan world over you. He's, He's just marveling at who's done this. And then he says, who has bewitched you? The who there is not the band, it's the Judaizers. And the Jewish false teachers, usually they come from Jerusalem They're plaguing these Galatian churches, and they're trying to convince them, listen, you should buy into a salvation that is by human achievement and reject this gospel that Paul talked about that's so easy and cheesy that's all about divine accomplishment, what God did. So you should be working this out. You should be doing this on your own. So bewitched you is basically talking about the Galatians were charmed by the Judaizers. It wasn't like they came in going, hey, I'm going to give you a false gospel. You know, they're coming in with this Really, instead of salvation by Jesus, it's salvation by Judaism. Uh, They're embracing a self-righteous by works. They want them to do that instead of a Christ-righteousness by faith. And doctrinal error uh, really always has two primary drives, okay? Maybe you have friends and family. They've kind of gone over into doctrinal error. It's always driven by two things. Are you ready? One is human ignorance. Two is, um, (laughs) how do I say it, Um, demonic malice, demonic malice. It's human ignorance and demonic malice, and the Galatians were battling with both. They were being ignorant, but they were also under spiritual attack, human ignorance and demonic malice. Now, I'm going off here for a second because false doctrine is the way of our day, and my job and our elders' job, and all those lay leaders over your community group's job, and our counselor's job, and everybody else's job, and disciplers over our youth in college and high school and junior high, we have a job, and the job is to prepare you for the next error. Not only the current error, but the next error. So we've been striving to make sure that you're aware of the filters that would help you to recognize error. Are you with me on this so far? So are you getting it? I wanted to make sure we're tuning you in and you're getting it, how you can be tuned into identifying error. So I've got basically some things I want to highlight for for you this morning is that anytime teaching adds anything to grace, to Jesus, or the gospel, it is what? Heresy. Say it like you mean it. It's what? Heresy. 
anytime one attribute of God, his love, his grace, his mercy, his sovereignty, his holiness, you elevate that above all the other attributes, what does it give you? It gives you, remember you've been to the carnival, carnival and you, ha, you stand in front of the mirror and it gives you a distorted view of you? That's exactly what elevating one attribute does. It's like taking your nose and making it four feet wide, right? Right? It, it distorts what you look like when you take an attribute of God and you expand it, say this is the most important, it distorts your view of God. It's, it, and it leads to what? Heresy. Okay, uh, leave the tension is what I'm trying to say here. God, anytime God is not totally sovereign and you're not totally responsible, anytime you say, well, we're not responsible or God's not sovereign, you're going to get into heresy. You leave the tension. Anytime you take a preference and you make it into a principle, it's either a compromise, legalism, or heresy. And the favorite one today is determining your theology by reading books, by reading blogs of 30-year-olds in their mother's basement, and instead of verse-by-verse -verse study, that can lead to heresy. It can, and that's bad, okay? So understand, those principles, Paul's trying to say, look, you cannot add to grace. That's what he's given him. The very first principle I just gave you, you cannot add to grace and then have it still be salvation by grace. The Galatians were being wooed over the spiritual feel of a works religion. It seems so sincere. You know, when you're really working hard at your faith, it seems so spiritual, it seems so dedicated, so committed. So they're saying, keep working at it, you guys. And the, the Judaizers, and they took that, and they began to lean towards that and began to reject a faith in the work of Christ crucified, received by grace, and a relationship with God. So look at the end of verse 1. We're still in verse 1. He says, For whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now what he's saying is, I portrayed Christ to you. I portrayed him. And that word portrayed is, is from the world of advertising. It was actually what they used when they wanted to sell attractive land. They'd put up a notice and it would telegraph to everybody. Now, Paul's not using a flannel graph. He's not using a sketch pad ad agency or an iPad this morning. Uh, Paul was basically using his mouth to portray Christ. And he's painting a picture for them. And here, a thousand words in proclamation painted a clear picture of Christ. He's out in the marketplace proclaiming Christ. He went from house to house in these Galatian churches and began to teach them. He, they, they saw Christ. They understood his work, providing a salvation of God's loving grace. He did it before their eyes through the proclaimed word. The crucified Christ was graphically and publicly displayed like a giant billboard. They're seeing a huge billboard of what Christ accomplished, that it's God who accomplishes salvation, not man. And that's why Paul repeatedly, when you read the New Testament, what's he say over and over again? Look at those verses there in your outline. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and what? Him crucified. It's significant that in verse 1 here of Galatians 5, he basically uses a tense when he says that Christ was crucified, alerting you to this. Are you ready? You need to get this. Because sometimes tenses and verbs really have sweet meanings, and this is one of them. When he uses the perfect tense there, basically he's saying this, this action of crucifixion was accomplished historically. It was accomplished, but that verb tense says it has present abiding results. In other words, the good news is that was done but the effects of that moment changed all of history and changed your lives. Can I hear an amen to that? That's why that's such so sweet, because he's saying, look, he, he was betrayed as crucified, but that crucifixion is not something in the past, it's right now. Right now, recognizing that Jesus was crucified on a particular day by particular men outside a particular city and a particular tree, and it was an actual fact, but the remains of that, that once for all sacrifice, that was, it is finished, sacrifice is now good today, accomplished today. According to God's strict standard of justice, sin demanded the death penalty, right? The wages of sin is what? And Jesus paid it. So by God's mercy, that sacrifice that Jesus made was accepted as the full price for sin. How much sin? How much of it? All of it. And this is what it means to portray Christ as crucified. There's more. 
God proved that he accepted the sacrifice Jesus made by raising him from the dead. So when you talk about Christ crucified, having been crucified, it's not just preaching the cross. You're preaching a resurrected Jesus who is alive today and here right now. Did you forget that he is omnipresent? And did you forget that he's ubiquitous, which means he's fully present right now? That's the Christ that you love and that worship. And the Galatians are negating that. And so here in verse 1, Paul's upset because they're forgetting all of this. And Paul had taught them that Jesus is crucified, but then some other teachers came along and they wanted to spray paint their graffiti on his billboard. They, they wanted, you know, he's portraying Christ for them. And so they wanted to basically go, okay, salvation by grace, fine, okay, good, good. But let's just do works right over that, okay, just like you're a gang member and uh, you're doing it, right? And so what they wanted to negate is like, well, no, no, if you just keep the Jewish law, then you can work your way up to heaven and somehow be right with God. And then they're totally ignoring that really the only way you can ever be saved is God does all the work and he did it through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the key. That's what's going on here. And that's what the battle is that Paul is fighting. And the Galatians needed a reminder that Christ Jesus did everything necessary for their salvation and everything necessary for your salvation. Listen, friends, don't lose this. This is why what we proclaim is good news. It's good news because no one can do it. No one can get there, but God loved you enough to do all the work on your behalf. That's why it's good news. And what the, the Galatians needed was a reminder that his cross is the all-sufficient atonement for sin, and our faith in Christ is the only and all-sufficient way to be justified before God. Listen, write it down. Don't be relying on what you can do, but on what Christ has done. Don't be relying on what you can do, but what Christ has done. Don't add anything to the work of Christ, otherwise it makes the crucifixion unnecessary, which is folly. It's folly. It's utter folly to try to get God to accept you by keeping rules, the law, by living a certain way. It's the only way to be justified, forgiven, and made right is by grace through faith. So he's trying to take you away from confidence in yourself, relying on yourself, right? So put no confidence there. The cross reminds you you cannot save yourself. Christ's death was necessary to, because your sin had to be paid for by the perfect one. And you'll stop trusting yourself not only when you remember the crucifixion, but secondly, when you trust independence upon the Holy Spirit. Number two, when you trust independence on the Holy Spirit. Now you got to see this. It's amazing. Deep down, the Galatians knew they were justified by faith alone. Uh, they knew it, but they're drifting. And so Paul says some pretty strong things here and focuses on the Spirit in verses 2 through 4. Look at verses 2 through 4. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the what? Hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, your own efforts? Did you suffer, and that word actually better means experience, did you experience so many things that Christ has given you in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now, I love the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He's not a force, he's a person. He doesn't come in doses, portions, or partially. He's a person. And as verse 2 implies, the moment you're truly saved, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you are not a Christian. Okay? It's not some sort of later work that goes on uh, that somehow you get the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. What does God say in Romans chapter 8, verse 9? If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not what? Belong to him. There you go. End of sentence. That's very clear. There's one God. He exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each person of the Trinity is involved in the salvation of a sinner. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the sinner, and now the Father and the Son send the Spirit to convert the sinner. All three persons are involved in a very, very technical way. That was very simplistic. The Galatians knew the regenerating power of the Spirit. They knew that. 
they had received spiritual gifts. They had, you know, and displayed his love, peace, patience, kindness, fruit in their lives. The Holy Spirit even worked his power among them. Having all these memorable experiences, the Galatians could never forget that the Holy Spirit was alive and at work and had done, and they had irrefutable evidence of God's work. Listen, why is it that people love it when we share testimonies here on Sunday morning? Because you see the evidences of the power of God. Do you not? Every time you hear that. And by the way, that goes on every day in the Christian's life, whether you recognize it or not is the incredible power of God in working in your life through providence. Remember, providence, every moment he's working. And understand, all things become new as a Christian. It's true. Even though you've been given a new nature, and even though you're still in this particular place, in this wonderful place of blessing, you are incapable of living the Christian life on your own. Or even glorifying God. Only God can glorify God. Only Christ can live the Christian life. And they do that through you by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who regenerates you in salvation. It's the Holy Spirit who matures you in sanctification. Did you get that? So, what do we need to do? Well, Paul's affirming this. Verse 2, first in your outline, depend on the Spirit in justification. Depend on the Spirit in justification. Look at verse 2. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive, that's at the point of salvation, the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, right? Did you do it? Did you receive the Spirit by your efforts or by God's gift? Answer? That's a no-brainer. It wasn't the works of the law. It was the hearing of faith. The Galatians had received the Spirit of God when they were saved. It was not through keeping the law. It was through saving faith granted when the the hearing of the gospel, like it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So Paul's appealing to their experience of the Galatians, their own salvation, to refute the Judaizers who are trying to cram some sort of keep the law gospel down their throats. Now think about what the false teachers were offering. The false teachers were saying, basically, what did they teach? They teach, well, if the Spirit comes by the working of the law, then there's something I got to do to get the Spirit. If I follow the regulations of the Old Testament law, then God will give me His Spirit, and the Judaizers teach the blessings of the Holy Spirit is God's reward for my spiritual achievements. You say, that's ridiculous. Yep. But would you admit one more time that each of us loves to take credit for our spiritual lives? Yeah. We love that. I can do it. Left to ourselves, we want some method that will guarantee a sweet spiritual experience. If I just do this, then it'll be sweet, and I won't have any trials. You know, just show me the button that I can press and get the religious cheese. But our God is not a mechanism, it's a relationship. And it's entered into by trusting person to person with him and so the indwelling presence of the spirit comes by faith and to the shock of some it's the spirit who indwells us first at salvation giving us the ability to respond in faith this may sound like heresy to you it's not the bible is really clear god regenerates us he makes us alive so an alive person can then respond in faith and in repentance he makes us alive you you turn in repentance and depend on him by faith after you've been regenerated. God had to do that. You were able to respond to Christ because of the Holy Spirit. You, you know this verse, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It's not in your outline. It says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done, not, not all the good stuff we did. That's not how He saved us, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit woke you up so you could respond to Him. Dead people do not choose to be resurrected. Are you with me? Right? So you need to be made alive to turn to Christ. You can't be saved unless you're drawn by the Father. And Galatians, they receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Verse 2. NIV says it by believing what they've heard. Uh, they, they, they received the gospel. Listen, the Spirit's work is not a reward based on your own spiritual achievement. Did you get that? The Spirit is not a reward based on your own spiritual achievement. The Spirit is a gift granted to those who believe in Christ's achievement. It's a gift who believe in Christ's achievement. 
And Paul reminds the Galatians, verse 5, the Father gives the Spirit. You don't determine that. There's no second blessing, my friends. Those who teach that don't realize that if you don't have the Spirit, you're not His. If He, he has you or you don't have Him. You get it? He has you or you don't have Him. But the gift of the Spirit is received by the same faith that lays a hold of Christ. The works, the gifts, the fruit of the Spirit belong to the very beginning of the Christian life, making your entire Christian life dependent and lived in the Spirit. So the Spirit justifies you. He's the Spirit of truth, so it can't be by error. It's got to be by truth, the Word of God. And then secondly, depend on the Spirit in sanctification. Depend on the Spirit in sanctification. Read verse 3. He says, Are you so foolish... Your father of faith again. Paul is stunned. Can you imagine how he must have been struggling here? How easily the Galatians have been duped. So he asks another pointed rhetorical question. Look at what he asks. He says, having begun, verse 3, by the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected by the flesh in our own strength? Listen, verse 2, what we just looked at. You were saved by the Spirit of God. Now, verse 3. You, you think you're going to be sanctified by your own efforts? He's the one who had to save you. You think you're going to somehow sanctify yourself? It was the Spirit who saved you. Now you think you'll be sanctified by yourself? Wake up! The Christian life finishes exactly the way it starts, by the Holy Spirit. Listen, the way into the Christian life is also the way on in the Christian life. Nothing changes. He says, are you so foolish? In the NIV, he's saying, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort, literally by the flesh, in your own strength? So he questions, are you trying to be perfected in your efforts here? The Judaizers were teaching that your weak human nature, your flesh, your strength, your strength can improve on the perfect, saving, sanctifying work of the Spirit. That's what they're teaching. They're saying, you can improve on what God has done. Anybody see the pride in that? Anybody? John Stott summarizes their false theology this way. Listen, look at that quote. They do not deny that you must believe in Jesus for salvation, but they stress that you must be circumcised and keep the law as well. In other words, you must let Moses finish what Christ has begun. Or rather, you yourself must finish by your obedience to the law what Christ has begun. You must add your works to the work of Christ. You must finish Christ's unfinished work. End quote. That's heresy. And Stotts pointed out what they're teaching, and there is never any need to refinish the finished work of Christ. Can I say that again? Is there ever a need to refinish the finished work of Christ? No. Uh, okay. So uh, l- let, me, let me help you with something. I'll, I'll just illustrate this. Maybe this will help. So Okay, I don't have this. I wish I did. But this is a baseball that is signed by the great Bambino. All right? And so I thought, you know what? That, that signature is a little bit not clear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chase over it. Right? Okay? Just like that. Looks, and it'll be much... Look at, look at how much bold that is. I could circle it, put stars over it. You know what the problem is? The very fact of me trying to improve that has actually ruined it. What was worth thousands of dollars is now worth nothing because I traced over it in the same way your salvation is the same. Your salvation is the same. You cannot improve what God has done. You cannot add to it. The only way salvation works is it's by God alone. Paul understood that only God can complete what he started, and he reminds you of this in multiple places in the New Testament. One of the most encouraging verses, right, in the book of Philippians is Philippians 1.6, and he uses the same word in verse 5 here, perfected, the same word he uses that in Philippians 1.6, perfected, and it means complete. Look at what he says, Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will what? Perfect it or complete it until the day of Christ. God's going to complete what he started in you. God's going to complete. Listen, Christian, stop being so discouraged. God's going to complete it. Since God alone will complete his work in us by faith, it is sheer folly to try to earn it any other way, even living good by the law. So the death of self-confidence 
comes as you realize you're completely dependent upon God for salvation and sanctification. God's going to do it. You say, I get to sit back and do nothing, right? Wait, you just violated one of the truths. God is absolutely sovereign, and you're absolutely what? Responsible. Say it with me. You're absolutely what? That means you got to step out. you got to pursue this, but God's the one who gets all the glory. When you mess up, you confess. When you know it works, God gets all the glory. Amen? That's how it works. The death of self-confidence comes when you realize you're completely dependent on God for salvation and sanctification. Thirdly, in your outline, recall the Spirit's provision. Recall the Spirit's provision as a believer. Now, the English translation of verse 4 is not the best, so let me help you. Verse 4, you can write this in your Bibles. Don't just put it in your outline. Write it in your Bible if you write in your Bible. It says, did you suffer so many things in vain? That word suffer is really not really a good choice. It should be experience. The word means experience, and sometimes it can be used in context to mean suffering and pain and hardship. But here, he's just talking and describing their personal experiences of salvation in Christ. Did you experience so many things? Now, now he, we could ask that of your kids here or of your own life here as, as you've watched God work in your midst. And I could say, listen, how many things have you seen where God has shown himself incredible, where God has changed the course of your life, where God has blessed someone else and radically changed their lives? How, you know, are you tracking with me? This is what he's saying. Look at all the things that you've experienced, if indeed it was in vain. And so many things here refers to all the blessings of salvation, of Christ, of the Spirit, of the Father. And he's reminding the Galatians here of the incredible blessings that you've received. Listen, some of you I know in your darker times, and I know in some of my dark times, we made lists of all the ways that God blessed us. And we kept that list going because we wanted to remember every moment that God had blessed us and God had worked in our lives. Anybody with me on that? You remember that. It restores your hope. And he's saying the same thing. Remember what God did. Uh, are you aware of God's blessings, the testimony of your own salvation and people around you when you celebrate that at baptisms or men ministering to men and women ministering to women and counseling and the people who have discipled you and the people you've discipled and shepherded and served with joy and all those things, you see God do incredible things. I mean... Even if you were to think of just what God does in salvation, the moment you and I are saved, theologically, the moment, 60 things happen. 60. It's incredible. I'm going to give you a few of them, and even some that happened before you were saved. I mean, you're elected before salvation, right? So God chooses you as his children you're predestined, meaning he decides your eternity, foreknowledge, which is a predetermined love relationship. He, he called you, he awakens you, right? This is now in salvation. You were dead, you were blind, you couldn't see. Now he awakens you to receive his mercy. Propitiation means he moves you out of under his wrath, now under his what? Mercy. Reconciliation, he changes you from his enemy. You were on the bad team, and now you're his friend. Redemption, he purchased you out of slavery into, you know, from slavery to sin into freedom in Christ. We could add even some more. Regeneration, he rescued you from death to be given eternal life forever. He changes you, so now you're a new person. Justification, he declares you righteous, forgiven over your sin, now innocent. You are innocent before a holy God. You are innocent before a holy God. Listen, last time you, next time you argue with your spouse, I'm innocent before a holy God, honey. Okay, so <laughs> adoption, you're given a new family right? You have, and sometimes your family of God is much more precious than your own family. You were a, the family of a murderous liar, and now you're related to Abba, Father. Sanctification, you're no longer owned by Satan, but now owned by God. Security, you're protected from eternal danger, now eternally safe from uh, e eternal danger, eternally safe. Glorification, instead of eternal punishment, now you have eternal perfection. Can you imagine all the things that he's given you at the point of salvation just poured and lavished over you. And Paul's saying, remember what he did. Listen, Christian, practically, stop forgetting what he's done to you, where your life was headed. That's why he reminds you constantly, remember what you were. Remember where you are. Remember how he's manifested himself in providence again and again and again and how he's blessed you. Oh, sure, life is hard. 
we're not in heaven yet, right? We're not home yet. Anybody with me? It's hard. But you have been blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And we don't practice that. And Paul's saying, remember how he blessed you. Listen, I hope you have these two verses down there in your outline. I've got them. I remember them by the 1-3. You've got to remember the 1-3. Ephesians 1-3 and 2 Peter 1-3, right? <clears throat> it says in Ephesians, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with how many? Oh, come on. How many? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, the 1 threes. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us how, what, how many things? Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us according to his own glory and excellence. With all the spiritual blessings, all that the Holy Spirit has done. They saw God's power among them, so Paul asked them pointedly, has it all been in vain? Wow. He says, look what he says in verse 4 there, so many things in vain for no reason? This all happened for no reason? You're going to abandon that? And all those incredible things happened for no reason? Paul hopes not. He hopes not. His words at the end of verse 4, if indeed, if it was in vain, are kind of hopeful, aren't they not? It kind of goes back, he says, perhaps yet not all is lost, and you can return to simple faith in Christ without the traditions and circumcisions and the law. In fact, number three in your outline, believe in the power provision of the Father for you. Believe in the powerful provision of the Father for you. Look carefully at verse five, at the one who provides you with the Spirit. Verse five, so then he, does he, the Father, who provides you with the Spirit, and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now, again, you all know this, that Jesus in his earthly ministry promised the coming of the Spirit, right? So he says, look, Acts 1.8, don't leave Jerusalem, wait for the gift that's coming. Wait for what the Father has promised. And then throughout the Gospels, and when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, Luke eleven thirteen 13, and John 16, 13, he'll guide you into truth. He'll not speak on his own initiative. This is the Spirit of God. Galatians 3, 5, he provides you with the Spirit, and provision is lavish you. You've been lavished. Listen, Christians, we forget our calling and our high calling. He's lavished you. You say, where do you, where do you get that lavish from? That's what the word means. It was used of patrons of the arts who would then pray pay for productions to be done, lavish the city with a production. Um, I was in Corinth, and in the street is uh, written, and the, there were brass letters in the street, so those have been taken, but the, 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 the stone still has Erasmus, this name, and uh, he's mentioned three times in the Bible, and Erasmus was the city treasurer of Corinth, and it was the purpose of people of, of wealth and privilege to bless their city. And the road, it said Erasmus, has built this road. And that's what he did. He built a road in Corinth, and that's how you bless your city. He lavished the city with these gifts. Are you tracking with me? That's provision here. That's what he's talking about. He's lavished you with this. And God provides you, lavish you with the Spirit. And then he adds, and God works miracles. Now, what is that? Now, miracles describes inherent power or ability to change the course of history and whatever, and, and the natural laws of, of, of basically that govern the world. And Paul may be describing miraculous events uh, that God accomplished through the apostle and God accomplished in these early days. Or Paul may have been describing the spiritual power over Satan, the world, the flesh, sin, human weakness that the Father bestows on his children, lavishes through his spirit. Now, I believe the best view here is scratch it out in your Bible, not miracles, but power. And the reason for that is that same word that's used for power here is used to be translated power in several key places. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, in the ability and able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the what? The power that works within us. These passages are describing the Spirit's power, not as miracles, but as power, and that's really what the focus is here. God has given you all the power you need to live for Him. We just read that in Ephesians 1.3. We just read it in 2 Peter chapter 1.3. He's given you all the power. Has God given you all the power you need to live the Christian life? Answer? Yes. yes. Through His Spirit. As we rely on the Spirit of God. 
God has given you all the power. Now, you put this whole passage together, and you have a powerful argument. Stop relying on yourself. Stop it. Look at your spouse when they're grinding away and they're complaining. Stop it. Rely on God's power. You don't have to live this way. You can live a different way. Live according to your calling. If a person has received eternal salvation through trust in the crucified Christ and they have been receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit basically at the moment of salvation, the moment you believed, and now you're a born-again believer, you have the Father, Spirit-endowed power working within you, how could you hope to enhance that by your own efforts? By, by improving God's already incredibly lavish work with human resources, some effort, some behavior, some action. Listen, turn from all actions of self-dependency and self-reliance and self-confidence and trust only in your loving Father and His gracious Son and all-powerful Spirit for all you need in the Christian life. Can I hear an amen to that? That's the point of this passage. Stop relying on you and rely on the one who's already proven to you that he can transform you and will work in you and through you. This is a, a plea to believers to depend every single day. This is a plea for those who might drift away and they don't really have Christ to turn back and to rely only on the sufficiency of Christ. This is a plea that those of you trying to work your salvation, somehow I've got my own form of Christianity, I've got you know, my own kind of you know, deal going on and I've defined Christianity and I'm a Christian, whatever, and it's saying you're not going to get saved by your works or your determination. It's only going to be God who saves you. Are you getting it? So track with me. Take this home. Living in Christ is a life of faith. It's a life of faith. Listen, the foundation is this. You were saved by faith, you continue in faith, and you're completed by faith. Can I hear an amen to that? There's no such thing as performance-based Christianity. Basically, you come to Christ by faith, you live by faith in sanctification, you die by faith in glorification. Letter B, living in Christ is a life of dependence. If I could get you to do one thing today, this would be it. Make a habit before you minister, before you go to your CG, before you're coming together to worship on Sunday morning, before discipleship of a student or anyone else, before you set up, before you take down, before you greet folks, before you make coffee, before you usher, before you preach at the jail, before you teach your women's Bible study, before you do anything, say, Lord, I can't do this, but you can through me. Just dependent on Him. Rely on Him for everything. I can't drive on the 15 without help. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. You've heard it. Be controlled, led, directed, empowered by the Spirit. Be saturated in the Word. Be obedient to the Word. Dependently relying on the Spirit. Confessing all known human sin that you've done with a desire to please Christ. Serve Him and share Him. Just live dependently. Not in your own strength. Let her see. I guess it's carving out of your life. I can do it. I can do it. Carve it out. Letter C, living in Christ is a life of comfort by the Holy Spirit. There are going to be bad days. I mean, you're going to be tested, and there's, you're going to doubt. You can say, is it true? Does God really love me? Does he really care about this trial that I'm going through right now? And when those doubts come, when you wake up in the morning, you need to say, when it's gloomy and hopeless, you need to say, you know what? I know what my real problem is. I'm a sinner, and I live in a sinful world, right? By the time you get in the shower, you need to say, although I'm a great sinner, I have an incredible Savior who loves me, and He gave Himself for me. And you start your day just with those two thoughts, you'll get through the day. You'll get through the day. Trusting in his grace. Lose your self-confidence. Don't try and work it up. Rely on him and grow in Christ's confidence and you'll know his comfort. And letter D, 
Living in Christ only comes as you die to self. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about it this week. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must what? Wait, wait, don't put your stuff away. That's evil. <laughs> evil. He must deny himself. I don't care who you are this morning. Stop trying to perform for Jesus Christ. Stop trying to perform. If you're his child, God has forgiven you. Christ has forgiven you all your sins, past, present, and future. God loves you as his own son or daughter. You say, but I still battle with sin. I hate sin. You should. But it's been paid for by the precious blood of Christ. Only time that it should concern you is if it's defiant, ongoing, unrepentant. Otherwise, just seek to remain relationally close. Please the one who loves you. Walk in sweet relationship with him through confession, repentance, and the help of believers. And if you're here today and you're wondering whether you do know Christ or not, it's pretty simple. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to the Father except through me. And you have to come to an end of yourself and recognize your sin separates you from God, and that's why he died on the cross. Your sin is horrific before a holy God. You cannot be in his presence. Your sin must fall and be punished on Christ. His righteousness covers you and makes you available and ready to be in his presence forever. Turn to Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. We pray now that you would work in our midst and cause our worship to be acceptable to you. We want to remember you in communion. Thank you for the way that you've blessed us. Thank you for the way that you've enriched us. We pray that we would respond in a healthy manner, in a worthy manner, a, a manner than which pleases you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, remain seated. We're going to prepare for a time of communion together. But let's sing this in response. Sing with us. In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in get to take communion together. This is such a sweet treat for us, so we're going to set our attention toward the cross right now. Before we pray, listen again to Paul's commitment in his letter to the Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, the message that saved us, sanctifies us, and the one we proclaim until he comes again. So as we prepare for communion, will you just join your heart with mine as I pray and set your attention with me towards the cross? Let's pray now. Lord, thank you for guiding our attention towards this one way 
to salvation. All the work of you, none of work of us. I pray that as your people, we as a church family gather and we hear this message that our hearts will be drawn towards the ways in our life that we're not lined up with you and your commands, that we're not standing and being sanctified and being changed and being directed by the gospel that saves us. I pray that we would keep short account with you, Lord, and that those things in our life where we are running astray or slightly off the target, that you would draw us back to yourself, that there would be confession of sin, and we would keep that short account with you. Help us as a people, Lord, your people, to be standing in the gospel that has saved us and to live in light of the grace that you've shown us in Christ's coming, living that perfect life that we couldn't, dying the death that we deserved. And because he rose from the grave, we too can live in that new life. Help us, Lord, to live and, and, and be guided by that reality. I pray in Jesus' name. And so now sing of the resurrection with me. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose. As he stands, and as he stands in victory, whole of the gospel in front of us before we even partake, because that's what we stand in, the totality of what Christ has done. He rose victorious from the grave, and so we can celebrate his death that made a way for us to be saved. So prepare that bread side of the cup, if you would, and I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, and then we'll all take together. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all do that together. And prepare that cup side as I read on in that same passage. Paul says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, and now these are Jesus' words, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's proclaim it together and all take the cup. Okay. Okay. Will you stand? And we're going to respond. This is the gospel that we all stand in. And I'm going to do a little fast forward here because we've run a little short on time. And uh, 
But, but I want to get our attention on this one true gospel in which we stand. We sang it earlier before service started. I want to bring it to the end here. If you can, uh, my, my gang at the back there, take us to verse 4. We're going to sing, and in this gospel, the church is one. And so as we sing this, think about the gospel that we stand in you, unifies us, and we all stand in union with our Savior, Jesus. It's this gospel that saved us, sanctifies us. It's this gospel that promises our future together. So let's sing these words. And in, ready? Here we go. And in this gospel, the church. We do not walk. We do not walk. We have his spirit. We have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home. Yes, it will. And when in glory. And when in glory still I will see this old story that rescued me praise to my savior the king of life i stand in the gospel of jesus now sing it when in glory and when in glory still i will sing of this old story that rescued me praise to my savior the king My Savior, the King of life, I stand in the gospel of Jesus. Oh, I stand. Oh, I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen to the truth that you just declared. Okay, before you head out of here, check out the screen where we do have uh, our, our app uh, QR code where you can stay a little bit more connected to our church. If you're not on our church app, you want to have that. If you have questions or need to connect or want counsel, uh, the Henrys are at the door. David and Zulma are right there. Stop off and say hi. And they'd love to talk with you, pray even, point you in a direction. If you need help getting connected in ministry, do that. Have a blessed Lord's Day. Christ dependence, not self dependence. Okay, keep preaching that to your heart as you go. Have a blessed day. Uh,